I've tried to do my best to keep you all interested and engaged. All right. I should probably warn you uh, that uh, my talk has a little bit of a technical bend to it, but uh, uh, I can't help it. I'm a computer geek, and it's just in my nature. But uh, also, as Hugh uh, pointed out, um, the technical aspects aren't uh, that fearsome, and I'm going to try and walk you through them as best as I can. Um, the, the relevance here, though, the hook, is that I want to expose you to some of the emerging ideas and technologies and tools that allow us to get some traction uh, on some of the wicked problems that Terry was talking about earlier. And so the focus of my research is connectivity. And we've heard some uh, talk about connectivity. I was very fortunate uh, that both Jeff Jones and Lawrence were talking during their presentations about some aspects of connectivity uh, and in their presentations as well. And I want to probably start off by being a little bit precise about what, what do we mean by connectivity. Even among connectivity researchers, there's a little bit of disagreement about you know, what, what is it that we mean. One way of looking at it is it's the degree of connectedness between populations. Now, that's a wonderfully unhelpful description, but really that's what it's about. We say we have a population A. What is its relationship with population B? Is it unidirectional, bidirectional? To what extent does something that takes place in the one population influence what happens in the other one? And uh, this can be for both uh, beneficial, uh, beneficial effects, such as spillover from uh, coral, reef, uh, f uh, coral reef fish populations, or it can be negative if we think about things like uh, disease or invasive species. The two types of connectivity that I'm going to be talking about today, though, are sort of demographic connectivity, and you could think about that in terms of migration of individuals between populations. But then the second one is genetic connectivity, and that's over time, because not genes don't simply go from one population to another and then that's it. They persist over time, and that persistence through time actually can be uh, quite significant. Uh, why do we care about connectivity? Again, we've, we've heard some, some things uh, from the other presenters, but uh, conservation planning, we want to know about both upstream and downstream effects. And in the case of genetic connectivity, long-term management. If we expect that uh, all of our genetic, genetic diversity in a particular region is the same, well, maybe we should think about allocating our resources elsewhere rather than preserving something that would be the genetic equivalent of a cornfield. How is it that we can go about actually evaluating connectivity? How do we, how do we go about measuring it? Well, the first and most obvious way is that we can, tr we can try to go out and observe it directly. Uh, one option would be taking out ships trawls, uh, barium tracers, uh, but particularly the ship-based research, uh, it can be extremely expensive. And uh, marine, organisms, marine organisms, many of them, are capable of producing millions, millions of uh, juveniles. And so it becomes very challenging to try and get any sort of sense of direct observation of connectivity. People can, people can try, but very challenging. Uh, the next most likely approach, and uh, one that Jeff talked about, was population genetics, where what we can do is take a look at some of the existing patterns. We can reconstruct the process, ba uh, often based on maximum likelihood. Um, this can also sometimes be uh, costly and labor intensive, but probably nowhere near as much as uh, direct observation. The third one, and the one that I'm a little bit more involved with, are simulations. Uh, Myself, I use a combination of object-oriented programming and individual-based modeling, which I'll get into a little bit earlier. It's, again, it's not as, as scary as it seems. Uh, it's extremely powerful, but the point is it requires input data and also validation. And so in some respects, we come back to the original problem that we do also need uh, either some form of direct observation or some population genetic research in order to make sure that these models, these expectations that we're generating are correct. 
So a little bit on individual based models. How do they work? What are they? These are a particular form of model, usually, uh, usually done using computer uh, simulation where the model behavior is based on the characteristics of individual objects. Now objects, another not very helpful term. What do we mean? Well, objects can be anything. I work with fish, but it is also possible to model corals, fishing boats, communities, markets, economies. The real key to individual based modeling is to capture the properties that you're talking about and the individual behavior. But we're a little bit fortunate in that regard because frequently when we go out and get survey information, we're, we're getting information from individuals. If we, if we survey people, if we survey fishers, the information is on an individual level and there's individual variation between them. People are different, fish are different, corals are different and those differences need to be reflected in our modeling approach. Once we have the, the characteristics of our individuals somewhat pinned down, we can then allow these objects to interact, massive numbers of them. And these massive numbers of interactions can then lead to emergent system-wide behavior. One of the real advantages is that we don't have to assume, again, everything behaves in the same way. Things can interact in radically different ways and see what ends up resulting. So again, for me, I tend to work with larval fish and examples of the characteristics and behavior that I'm talking about can monitor their location, age, for example, date of birth, uh, fecundity, how many reproductive offspring do they produce, mortality, uh, what sort of condition are they in, do we expect them to die anytime soon, um, behavior, how do they mate, how do they move. Uh, I'm, in, I'm very interested in also giving them genetic information in order to evaluate how genetic structure evolves in large communities over time. It would be just as easy to also store information if they pass through, for instance, uh, certain chemical elements in the water. That sort of information could be stored as well, just as it would uh, in an otolith of a fish. But in addition, we have a tremendous amount of information that is uh, coming, coming out for geographic information systems. Here, this is the Coral Triangle region, uh, not the entire region, unfortunately, uh, uh, don't have anything for Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, but uh, here, the South China Sea, the Makassar Strait, uh, Philippines, parts of Indonesia and uh, Malaysia as well. But what we have here are different coral reef locations. So we have an indication of where the coral reefs expect, where we expect the coral reefs to be in this region. We also have oceanographic information from different ocean current models. Primary productivity would be another one. Temperature. All of these can interact with the individual objects and they will behave accordingly. So just to give you an example of what that kind of simulation might look like, here we can see particles that are diffusing in accordance with ocean currents. But I often have people ask me, oh, so you're just doing, doing a particle tracking. No, I want to emphasize these are responding to all of the spatial data that we have available. For instance, temperature or uh, primary productivity or vertical behavior. These are intelligent agents. They're intelligent individuals, intelligent in the sense of computer uh, artificial intelligence, but they're not just randomly responding to, they're not just randomly responding to ocean currents. They have active responses to the different model parameters. What we can then do is we can get a sense of where do we expect to find these different larvae over time. And so for, for particles that are released in the area of the Macassar Strait, 
uh, essentially released from locations near red, what we can see is that where do we, when they're eligible to settle, where are we most likely to find them? That's what this picture is showing. And what it says to us is that, yes, for the most part, the ocean currents have it so that the particle, that the larval fish are returning to area, they stay close to home. Although, they are also capable of traveling extensive distances, but the key is that most of them tend to stay close to where they were released. So this is for the Macassar Strait, but we can also do this for other areas as well. For instance, near Halmahera. And we can see the Halmahera eddy here circulating around and get a sense of where are the currents transporting our intelligent fish larvae. This is an example for the Sulu Sea and the Sulu Archipelago. And something which I want you to uh, take note of is that for the most part, things are retained within the Sulu Sea and then they're ejected out this way. We don't tend to see a whole lot of transport back out into the South China Sea. In contrast, these are releases from the South China Sea and they do end up in the Sulu Sea. So we have an idea of when we release these particles, where do they go? But what we can do is we can go back to our original coral reef map where we released the different particles from and we can also say, well, where did they go? This is connectivity. We want to know if a population A goes to population B, what's the probability that it's going to end up there? This is what people are looking for when they're looking for information on connectivity. And so what we can do, and I don't expect you to jump up and say, aha, of course, this is what this is, but this is a matrix of probability values, okay, going from a source population to a destination population. Now I spend days, weeks, months looking at this, so again, I don't expect people to, to distill this down right this second. What I do want you to take note of though, is that things tend to cluster along this diagonal here. What that means, again, is what we saw in the pictures, things tend to actually remain close to home just based on uh, the oceanogra oceanographic information and the behavior that we coded into our uh, intelligent organisms. Now this gets us to demographic connectivity, which I said was one thing that we were interested in, but if we wanted to start to match it up with genetic connectivity, how would we do that? I'm not going to go into the algebra of that for you, but really it's nothing more complicated than actually just taking the exponent. And so we can then begin to project connectivity through time. And we can say, oh, well over 10 generations, what does the spread start to look like? Over 100 generations, what does the spread start to look like? Again, I'm not going to have you worry about the ins and outs of the values, but something that you might think is really obvious is, wow, you know, we have this block here, but on the other side of the matrix, this is empty. What does that mean? And remember that, that uh, plot that I showed you earlier where the Sulu Sea does not go into the South China Sea, but the South China Sea ends up going into the Sulu Sea? That's what ends up happening. It, act, it ends up acting as a one-way latch mechanism. And so I'd like to test it a little bit more, but it, it seems to be uh, fairly interesting so far. Now that we have this connectivity information, we can then start to play with it a little bit. We can start to uh, do a little bit of analysis. One sort of fairly reasonable thing that we can do is take a look at, well, how similar are the different populations in terms of their composition, okay? And so, by taking a look at similarity, we start to see distinct flocks starting to form. And we could say, ah, well, this flock of populations is fairly similar to one another. These are not. And so, this is the Coral Triangle type area. This is the South China Sea, and this is a little bit closer to Thailand. Again, don't worry too much about it, but what we can then do is just go ahead and start doing some clustering with it. So areas that are the same color start to form 
natural clusters, again, just based on migration and intelligent behavior alone. And uh, I had the good fortune of talking with Allie Green, who works with the Nature Conservancy, and she had a completely, uh, through a completely separate process, based on expert opinion and a, a number of other factors, uh, I was able to sit down with her and she said, wow, you know, these actually end up looking like some of the uh, regions that our experts develop just by drawing on paper. Again, it's nothing, nothing concrete so far, okay, but the, the, the match is, is sort of encouraging. You can also take a look at, well, what's the sensitivity of the matrix? Actually, specifically, this is elasticity for, for those who, uh, who want to be specific. But what this tells us is out of our connectivity matrix, if we start changing those values, which ones are going to have the greatest effect on the entire matrix structure? And what we can see is that near the Spratly Islands and the Sulu Archipelago, these are going, if these reefs are sort of taken out of the equation, you're going to end up changing the connectivity structure. So that's, that's one component. Philippines also looks to be uh, fairly important, as well as uh, near the Saram Sea uh, off of Sulawesi. Uh, another thing that we can start to do is say, well, where do we expect the greatest number of uh, genes to be accumulating? And naturally, the, the coral triangle ends up being fairly high. But if we end up taking a little bit of a, quant, uh, a percentile approach, the bird's head near uh, Halmahera seems to pop out. Again, this is, this is uh, modeling, and I expect you to treat it, treat it with the skepticism that it deserves, but we do need some monitoring to say, well, is, is, is this actually what, what we're seeing in the field? I don't have this for Southeast Asia right now, but I did work, uh, uh, I have collaborated with Peter Mumby in the Caribbean, and we actually put uh, we put it to the test with uh, Montastria faviolata, where we, he went through the Caribbean, sampled, field sampled uh, their, the genetic structure, we compared it with the model structure, and on a loose basis, it ended up comparing fairly well, and when we put it through a relate test, uh, we had a 50% match. Now, this is a case of glass half full, glass half empty. You can say, well, 50% match, well, that's fine, but it's not good for prediction. But I don't think, I, I would want to say that prediction isn't the point. If we get a match, then that's wonderful, but it's really the differences. It's the differences that matter. What We see what we expect based on migration, but if we don't see that, then we're missing something fundamental from the equation. We need to find out what it is that we're missing from our assessment of connectivity. So some next steps. Uh, one obvious one would be to work with higher resolution oceanographic data. Right now, the HICOM model that I work with is 1 12th of a degree. And oceanographers know it doesn't resolve inshore very well, which is where, unfortunately, a lot of our coral reefs are. Uh, it's, it's just the way that it is right now, um, but they're working on it, and as soon as the data becomes available, we'll try and integrate that as, as best as we can. The other thing is, right now, even though we have intelligent agents, uh, the behavior is still fairly simple. Uh, they have vertical uh, migration, but perhaps there are uh, competitive interactions or strong trophodynamics, trophy but the advantage of using the object-oriented approach is that I can program a fish and then swap it out with more detailed data, less detailed data, whatever, whatever is sort of required. It's, it's a nice advantage of using object-oriented programming for your modeling. It becomes